Good morning and welcome to Together in God, a media ministry of Grace Lutheran Church of the ELCA at 202 West Grand Avenue in Eau Claire. We are excited to share with you today God's message of love and hope for all. Please join us now in worship. Good morning, all. Welcome to worship. A couple of announcements before we begin. We're excited to have the son of the congregation, Pastor Jim Page, here this morning. Uh, our Lutheran tradition, you can't throw confetti and stuff when he's preaching, so just <laughs> calm down a little bit. 
As you know, Pastor Phil is off on his uh, mission trip to Guatemala, uh, translating the scriptures in native languages, and we can pretend we're sharing it all that this morning. I everyone to please stand. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And let us join together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Let us join our voices together with our opening hymn, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. And let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from the epistle, Ephesians chapter 5. Once we were in darkness, but now in the Lord we are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do in secrecy. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, sleepers, awake. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Word of God, word of life.
You may be seated for the gospel. The gospel today comes from John chapter 9. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made the mud spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and I washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath day and Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents then said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So the second time they called the man who was blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found them, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to them, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, 
I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, dearest brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I get into my message, thank you to all the readers and musicians and Mitch for your leadership today and kind of telling Pastor Jim, this is where you need to go and everything. It's kind of nice to be back in my church, but this is the first time I've ever presided over an entire service in my home church. So it's kind of a special day as well. Thank you to seeing some familiar faces. And I do have two announcements. First of all, I got a message here uh, during the choral anthem that Pastor Phil messaged that he's watching us online on Facebook. So Phil, I'm trying. They're trying to behave themselves. So those of you watching online, thanks for joining us today as well. And leave a comment. If you're watching from somewhere outside Eau Claire, let us know where you're watching as well. And uh, some of you also know that my mother uh, fell at home uh, a little over a week ago and um, broke her right shoulder. It's not her dominant arm, so she can hit my dad and keep him in line. Um, but uh, she, she's miserable. Um, I haven't seen her like in this much pain for quite a, forever. So um, on the count of three, she's also watching at home. She does not know I'm doing this. So when you give your son a pulpit, I can do whatever I want and say whatever I want. So on the count of three, she's watching at home. Can we just say hi, Bev, on the count of three? All right. One, two, three. Hi, Bev. And we're all coming over for lunch, Mom. There we go. Okay, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Uh, in, on March 5th, 2000, 2020, uh, my son and I went to Sarasota. It's an hour south of where we lived in Florida. And uh, we were going to watch a spring training game between the Baltimore Orioles and our favorite team, the Minnesota Twins. Well, we went there, and we were sitting in left field or on the third baseline. And the Minnesota Twins came out, and uh, they did their warm-ups. And then they just ran quickly into the dugout. Well, if you're not familiar with spring training ball in Arizona or Florida, it's kind of a dynamic. The players are intentional in spending time with fans before the game, taking photos, meeting fans, signing autographs, because the vast majority of people going down for spring training spent a considerable amount of money to get there. So that surprised me. That was the first time I ever saw a professional t baseball team on the field for a quick warm-ups and then run into the dugout, and then the game started. Well, me. I wanted to know what was going on. I was patient, so I went and got a Coke, and Ben was sitting there in our seats, and I went and asked one of the employees, and as she, I walked in the concourse, all the employees were wearing rubber gloves. I thought, that's strange. So I asked one of the employees, I said, so what, what's, what's with the quick warm-ups and no autographs for our kids and everything? And she said these words. The um, reason I know, she, I wrote them down after I, she left. She says, I know, I know, it's odd, isn't it? Players not with fans. Major League Baseball's new policy is that players can no longer meet with fans before or after a game. I guess there's more and more concern over that virus. She said these words verbatim. I don't think that thing is going to amount to anything. Three years ago, last week, the world changed. Six days later, after I left that stadium with my son in that baseball game, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. So throughout my sermon, I'm going to refer to that handout you have there. So the handout number one there, on January 7th, 2020, a renowned science journalist named Helen Broswell wrote about the high transmissibility of the COVID virus, and she got many people's attention when she wrote these words. When I study the virus, this is all quite startling what's happening in our world. And to be honest, I'm not liking the look of this. John Casey is a professor at Wagner College in Staten Island, New York, and he said this in an interview on April 24th, 2020. He, wrote, he said in this interview, I'm a lapsed Catholic, but seeing Pope Francis delivering a message about the COVID pandemic by himself in the middle of a dark, rainy, and lonely St. Peter's Square filled me with hope. And he continued on. 
hope that God was with us. And then he paused, looked down at the ground, and a few seconds later looked up again and continued what he was saying. Hope that God was with us when many of us were scared. It's true that we enjoy life when life is predictable. Certainty makes us happy. Uncertainty and change is upsetting. For example, you go to our favorite grocery store is Festival. You go to your favorite grocery store and you go to the produce section, you're going through your shopping routine, and they have the audacity to put the tomatoes in a different section than last week where they were. I mean, come on. And then sometimes you come into church, and Garrison Keeler says this a lot, you come into church and you notice someone is sitting in your seat. And the thing is, now get this, you know, you know what I'm talking about. The thing is, you come into your church and you know that that seat has an imprint of your rear end after sitting there over and over and over again. And the thing is, you could sit and worship, Garrison Keeler would say, you could sit and worship and Jesus could walk down the center aisle and you wouldn't care. Why? Because someone was sitting in your seat. And we can laugh about it. But when our predictable routine life and its certainty comes head to head with something that throws it off course, we immediately go back to what was taken for granted. That being those values and beliefs that were always there when everything was fine. Because the thing about uncertainty is that uncertainty doesn't alter our value system. Uncertainty exposes our value system. And it's our reactions to those uncertain situations in life that give us a way and then show others who we truly are. Because amid the pandemic, all of us can agree, we witnessed how uncertainty exposed values and behaviors to a level many of us had never experienced in our lives. And some of those values and behaviors were not at all reflective of what Christ taught. And for people that heard the hurtful words and saw the harsh reactions of their friends who they know were Christians, well, now they had a reason not to return to church. And at the center of it all was what we value most, winning. The feeling that we are right, that we are on top, that we have control, that life is the way we think it should be. And on the other side is our biggest fear, losing. Losing control, losing rights, losing our voice, losing what we want. Certainty and uncertainty, winning and losing, are at the center of our gospel reading this morning. And my main point for this sermon today is to reflect God's love in an uncertain world. Jesus and his followers are not in it to win it. So I'm going to walk you through the scripture reading that the four wonderful readers read this morning, and then I'm going to end this morning with a true story in my ministry that I think sheds light to the goodness of God in this gospel story. And then we're going to go to my parents' house for lunch. There we go. So we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. John is, as you know, one of Christ's disciples. And a little con I want to give you a little context to this story. In Jesus' ministry, Jesus liked to travel, as you know. And he would often travel from the north in Galilee, that's where his hometown was, and go to the south, which was in Judah, in, where the holy city of Jerusalem was in Judea. So he had Galilee and Judea. So Jesus preaching in the north was fine, because he had crowds there, and it wasn't that big of a deal. But the problem was when he would go south and he would have crowds, it got the religious leaders anxious because if the religious leaders didn't have control of the people, Rome would find out and Rome would send a delegation to Jerusalem to punish the leaders and restore order. But Jesus was kind of funny like this, and this is true in historical documents. Jesus would preach in the north, he'd go to the south, rav up the crowd, and then go back north again over and over and over and over. And today, where do you think this gospel story is? That's right, good Lutherans, in the South. Jesus is in not just the South, in the region, he's in the holy city. So you could say Jesus is bringing his A-game in this story. 
So Jesus sees a man born blind. I'm going to go th quickly through the story because it's important to look at the key details. Jesus goes up, he approaches a man born blind. He was likely, this man was likely a beggar throughout his life. And in ancient culture, if you were born blind or if you had a physical ailment or if you were going through a challenge in life, it was believed that you were being punished for something. Or if you were born with a disability, such as blindness, it was your parents' sin that caused that blindness. So Jesus told his disciples that the meaning behind this was to glorify God, and he, he uh, moves forward. And after a short dialogue, he spits on the ground. I'm really going to go fast. He spits on the ground, makes some mud, and smears it on the man's eyelids. It's a beautiful, like, wonderful, inspirational story, but I want to take a commercial break here. Now consider the blind man. He's defenseless, and I'm sure he heard and received verbal and physical abuse. But if you're the blind man and you hear a, a person near you spitting on the ground repeatedly, and then all of a sudden you have moist mud on your eyes, wouldn't you be a little disgusted and think it was a mean joke? Think about that. So after putting mud on the man's eyelids, Jesus tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man literally, the only man, first person in the Bible to literally do this, to walk by faith and not by sight. You see how I threw that in there? That was worth the drive down here to Grace Lutheran, just hearing that phrase. He goes in the pool of Siloam. Now imagine his anxiety of what Jesus said and what he was supposed to do. He's touching the water. He, water touches his face. He washes and his eyes slowly open. And it's the first time in his life he can see. And I'm sure it was uncomfortable. He sees the bright sunlight. He sees the sky. He sees people. And in the stillness of the water, he sees his reflection for the first time. He's likely overwhelmed by what he saw. And after it happened, uncertainty entered the scene. John includes first that his neighbor saw him and said, isn't that the man who was born blind since birth? And the other neighbor says, no, that's someone else. And the man insisted, no, I am the man. Well, then how were your eyes open? I don't know. The guy called Jesus put mud on my eyelids. He told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and now I can see. And then they add the most ridiculous question. Well, where is this man? Get this answer. Brilliant answer. I don't know. I didn't see where he went. that upset people. So they take them to the temple where the religious leaders are. And not only is this healing a disruption, Jesus healed, and Wilma mentioned it here in this pulpit, on the Sabbath. Uh-oh. You don't heal on the Sabbath. The blind man broke the Sabbath because washing is an act of work. You can't do that on the Sabbath. And it gets even worse. They didn't even believe he was born blind. They thought it was all a scheme. So they summoned his parents to come to the temple. And it's being summoned to the temple by the religious leaders on the Sabbath is kind of like being called into the principal's office on a Friday. You're in trouble. His parents simply said, that's our son. We don't know how he can see. He's old enough. Let him speak for himself. Let's stop there. Mom and dad walk in. Their son sees them for the first time. And they don't even go to bat for him. Can you imagine how defeated this man must be? And they don't even speak up on behalf of Jesus. And the leader simply said, this Jesus guy broke the Sabbath. He's a sinner. He had nothing to do with it. Well, then... The blind man has had enough. This upsets the blind man. He says, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. And I imagine he's just up in the face of the religious leaders. And they said, well, how then did he open your eyes? And he just said, I told you already. Do you want to become his disciples too? Ooh, he's really throwing it at him. John writes, they hurled insults at the blind man. Well, not he can see now. You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses, meaning we know what's familiar. We have rules. We have control. We know what's right. And he said, this is remarkable. He opened my eyes. If a man was not sent from God, 
He could not do this. And finally, sin, this is the worst part of it all. You were steeped in sin at birth. You deserve to be blind. Do not lecture us. And they threw him out of the temple. It's a powerful reading. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? But it's a story I believe in the scriptures that show us that the Bible is relevant today. Because uncertainty exposed their value system. Even with the goodness of God trying to break into the world, they weren't having it. It was a system based on control, judging others, criticizing others, and being right. Imagine a man standing before them who regained his sight, and they simply don't care. They were blind. And that's what happens. And that's what happens when the pursuit of winning takes over. It makes us blind to two things. It makes us blind to other people and what they believe. And it makes us blind to the impact of our words and our actions. Because you can look around, all of us in this room, and those of you watching online, we can look around in our society and we can see people trying to win and to get ahead of others. It's in politics, it's in careers, in school, in sports. Churches are competing for members now in the wake of COVID and increasing membership rules. And at times, society can be mean and ugly, especially in social media. But this gospel is a story of God trying to break into the world again to say to us, stop, let me open your eyes. I want to give you a better perspective to see the goodness around you that I have given you. Because out of a divine love, God's love sent Jesus into our world to teach us that losing, that being surrendering our control, following him, giving of ourselves to others, it's by losing that blessings abound. Because Jesus was in Jerusalem in the holy city in this story. And from this moment on, he never left. He stayed in Jerusalem. The leaders began to hate him even more. The crowd began to hate him even more. And they cheered when he was arrested. They cheered on his trial. They cheered when they hear his screams from the cross. When they thought they won and he died, the threat was gone. And the thing is, this phrase came to me when I was um, working out in my basement, and it's just, I think it's brilliant. If you don't like it, well, I hope you like it. Jesus lost on purpose for a purpose. Ooh, that preach is good on Sunday morning. Jesus lost on purpose for a purpose. He lost in order to show the magnitude of God's love for you. The forgiveness of your sins, when you hear the words of forgiveness, when you see the bread and wine of the holy meal, and he shows the power of living in a, differently in our world, that by losing, we will be blessed. So here's my final story. In the midst of COVID, all of us were scared and overwhelmed when it all began. And technology was the new thing. Of course, you know FaceTime and Zoom and whatever. And many people struggled. I struggled with some technology. But in my ministry, many uh, senior citizens in my former church were struggling with FaceTime and Zoom and connecting with parent and family. They were just frustrated. Well, this story deals with a gentleman named Ed. Ed is in his late 80s at this time. And Ed um, would always swear about his phone and technology, that he never could get it to work properly. And... Um, because his wife, Alice, she was the technology expert. But Alice died in the end, towards the end of December 2019. So Ed was alone in his home, as you know, with the COVID. And his wife, he dearly grieved over. 
She did all the technology at home. Now he had a greater void in his life. His family did his best to support him, and they were patient with his outburst and his cursing about technology. But when it was safer to do so, one of his granddaughters went over to his house, and of course they're wearing their mask, which, which is good to do. And she says, Grandpa, I have a gift for you. So they sat down at the dining room table, and with both wearing masks, she opened up her MacBook. He says, don't show me any more of that technology stuff. Well, she ignored Grandpa, and after a few clicks, she put up the computer screen, and she slid it over to him, and he saw a, a photo from the 50s of his wife, Alice. He said, hey, that's, that's an old photo. Isn't, isn't, she, isn't she a beauty? And he always called her my bride. And then his daughter pushed a button. And the photo began to move. Her smile would get brighter. Her eyes would move a little bit. And she'd tilt her head ever so slightly. It's like the photo came to life. And as it happened, Ed said, I'm sorry I'm going to say this, what the hell? <laughs> this is true. And then he sat staring at the screen with both hands over his nose and his mouth and his mask. And he said, I have never seen anything like this. Her little dimples were so cute when she smiled. And look at them, there they are. And she's looking at me. I can't believe it. Thank you, sweetheart, so much. And he gave his granddaughter a hug. She said, Grandpa, I know you don't like technology, but we're going to have it for a long time. This will eventually end, we hope. But this is a new photo program I found that brings pictures to life. We thought you wanted to see her again. All of us can be resistant to things that bring uncertainty and change in our lives. And all of us can be set on winning in whatever shape that takes. But as followers of Christ who follow a Savior, a Savior who acted to give sight to a blind man, a Savior who stayed in that holy city to show everyone that he lost on purpose for a purpose, I think it's encouraging for us now and this week as his followers to lose on purpose for a purpose, to lose resentment when we forgive, to lose sin and guilt when we hear words of forgiveness, and to lose ourselves, to allow God into our lives. Because it's then that we will be blessed and be a blessing to others. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word today from John chapter 9. Thank you for the persistence of the blind man, for holding to what the goodness that Jesus did for him. And thank you for this inspiring word may it continue to guide us in how we live out our faith, to live as Christ lived, to receive your blessing, and to lose on purpose as we allow you into our life and that we are a blessing to others as well. We ask this name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
living together in trust and hope. Let us confess our faith as we use the historic Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Eternal God, today we heard how Jesus gave sight to a blind man. In the wake of that miracle, a few were upset and even resistant to your goodness. Forgive us when we hinder your blessing among us. Continue to guide us to share your goodness so that others may know and see your presence in our world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Shepherding God, you created the church to be a beacon of hope and peace for everyone. Bless and lead all pastors and congregations as they follow you in sharing the good news of the gospel. Thank you for providing the church and our congregation with Pastor Jim's presence today and Pastor Phil's leadership and ministry. May Pastor Phil's trip, uh, Pastor Phil's trip to Guatemala be safe and uplifting as he teaches your word to others. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Comforting God, we pray for those areas in our country where drastic weather has affected the lives of millions. For the Northeast, as it adjusts to record amounts of snow. For those in California where flooding continues and powerful winds and power outages. May supplies and assistance bring comfort to all in need. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Healing God, as Jesus healed the blind man, bring your healing presence to all who live with pain, be it physical, emotional, or spiritual. Bless all doctors, nurses, chaplains, and counselors as they use the gifts you gave them to bring comfort and healing. We especially ask for this comfort and healing for those we name in our hearts and aloud. Merciful God, receive our prayer. prayer. Loving God, we give thanks for those who have, over the years, carried your message to the world and this congregation. Today we remember uh, the passing of Ella Lowe. We also uh, received word this morning that Betty Barabo's sister, Jane Ponzer, Severson has passed away. Gracious God, bring comfort to her and her family. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us, excuse me, into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. And let us join in praying the prayer that our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Dearest brothers and sisters, receive the blessing. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, serve in love. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being part of our Together in God worship service. Your prayers and financial support are always deeply appreciated. Please tune in again next Sunday at the same time or join us in person at 10 a.m. in the church. Remember the 9 a.m. coffee hour. Go in peace, serve the Lord.